So the, the presentation is called The Future of Wireless in Africa, which is probably overstating the case a little bit. Um, it, it's, it's about spectrum, and it's, it's, it, most of what I've learned, I've learned in South Africa. First of all, this is, uh, this is who I am. Uh, most of my time is spent on uh, Village Telco, uh, a social enterprise to develop low-cost wireless uh, telephony and, um, and internet services. Uh, what I was about to show you was an undersea cables map, which um, um, I also um, invest some time in developing. And um, what you may gather from that is that I have... Uh, an abiding interest in uh, the state of, uh, of access on the continent, both from a point of view of looking at what are the, uh, the breakpoints in terms of um, uh, makes me feel like I should have paid for that trial. Okay, let's try again. Hopefully this will work. Um, So, undersea cables map. I, I'm very keen, you know, a lot of what I spend my time on is working out what are the major obstacles to access on the continent. And uh, thanks to a little bit of support from Google Africa, I'm actually extending this map now to build a terrestrial fiber map. And if any uh, of you are interested in that, I'd be happy to talk up to you offline. But, um, but the, real, the real winner, the real sort of magic bullet here is, uh, is Spectrum. And, um, and the reason for that is that, well, you can only have to compare the ISP industry in South Africa to the, to the telco industry. You know, the ISP industry, industry is ruthlessly competitive. Lots of innovation, not, lots of new ideas going on, whereas the telco industry, comparatively, spe specifically the mobile industry, comparatively slow. In, you know, when, when you compare it with the, the, sp the state of innovation and the drop in prices that has gone on with internet service providers. Well, there's one thing that distinguishes ISPs from mobile operators, and that's access to spectrum. It's a big deal. It's a huge barrier, and it's very difficult to get competition going in the mobile space or in the, in the telco space uh, without access to that spectrum. So, um, and this is what we're talking about. You can see on the screen there, generally, in the range of radio spectrum uh, from about 30 uh, uh, megahertz up to 30 gigahertz. Mostly, you know, of um, recently, the, the, most the most interest has been in that, uh, in that middle range of, uh, of spectrum, which is the, the sort of about 600 to, um, uh, 600 to say, about 3 gigahertz. So um, that range, popular range, mobiles are in there, uh, 2.4 gigahertz unlicensed is in there, Neotel's got a slice of CDMA spectrum in there, it's a, busy, it's, a, it's a busy place. But now interest is shifting with the digital dividend to down into the television spectrum and uh, other services in that spectrum looking at what opportunities are there and indeed new technologies are being developed higher up the spectrum band. So more opportunities are emerging. And what we're seeing is that... Um, uh, you know, the, uh, there's an increasing desire to understand spectrum uh, simply because we want more access to it. And of course, one of the one of the basic things we've learned about uh, about spectrum is that um, the further the lower down you get in the spectrum band, the better propagation you get. So that's why people are excited about 900 spectrum, 900 megahertz spectrum. Uh, but even more exciting is down into the 700, 600 megahertz where you get longer waves that propagate better. They go through concrete, they go through foliage, so it's, uh, it means fewer towers. It's exciting. There is a trade-off, however, that people tend to call it beachfront spectrum, but there is a trade-off that the lower you go down in the spectrum band, the, um, the lower your throughput in terms of um, uh, you know, the maximum amount of data that you can pack into a specific band. So it's, it's not all uh, sweetness and light. But while we understand the technology of spectrum fairly well and are getting better at it, the economics of spectrum management isn't well understood or is, is still hotly debated, let's say. So the question of whether we should treat um, wireless spectrum as private property or as a common resource is, is still a you know, subject of uh, a big debate. So is it something, is it like, you know, a, a stretch of land that we want to make sure we get maximum value out of and therefore we want to give it to someone who will take care of it as opposed to exposing it to what they call the tragedy of the commons where everyone has access and it gets overused and suddenly it's no longer usable anymore. 
there are lots of arguments for that, that position. Equally, there are people who say, look, it's like data, it's reusable, it's flexible. Um, and, you know, and why don't we have a spectrum commons in the same way we have like open source software? And of course, with all complex things, the truth is actually somewhere in between. And to illustrate that truth, I would like to, to introduce to you two people. Um, this is uh, on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, uh, this is Claude Shannon, a mathematician, and uh, in around 1950, um, he came up with uh, uh, a law or a... Uh, uh, some people call it uh, Shannon's bound, but basically it was a mathematical theorem that said there is actually a hard limit to the amount of data that you can compress into a given amount of bandwidth. I mean, that, that, so, so that there isn't, that, that, that bandwidth is not infinitely flexible. So, uh, and this we know, and actually the mobile operators who are developing LTE services will tell you that LTE and advanced LTE is actually getting very close to Shannon's bound in terms of how much data. So there is this hard limit there at the same time, I'd like to introduce you to Martin Cooper. And Martin Cooper worked for Motorola. He's credited with inventing the mobile phone and for found, or acquainting another law called Cooper's Law, which uh, analogously to, uh, uh, to Moore's Law says that spectrum capacity, spectrum efficiency, is doubling every 30 months. And not only is it doubling every 30 months, it has done so for the last 100 years. So these two laws seem uh, a little bit in conflict with each other, that, uh, that how can we uh, be approaching a hard bound yet you know, experience all this increasing efficiency? Well, it, the answer there, it turns out again, is complex, that for a single transmitter and a, a, you know, a, a standard sort of mobile um, uh, tower that, that's transmitting, they may approach that bound, that, that Shannon's bound, but there are lots of other configurations for how you deliver bandwidth with, uh, with smaller cells, lower power, more sort of, you know, clever antennas, uh, MIMO antennas, beam forming, where you can actually achieve uh, much more efficiency. So there's no, when, when people tell you, you know, there's a hard limit, you know, it's not, the answer is not that simple. And also when people tell you, you know, you know it's, it's, it's infinitely flexible, it's not like that, it's somewhere in between, which makes it a hard thing to regulate because it's neither fish nor fowl. And of course the reason why we regulate is for one reason only, is to manage interference. And the only thing I want to say about interference is that the spectrum interference, wave interference, is not the same as um, you know, interference when you're queuing for a bus, interference in trying to uh, apply for a, a, a spectrum license. Um, that kind of interference is obstructive, whereas spectrum interference is, is merely um, obscuring. Waves don't disappear when they bounce into each other, they pass through each other. And if we had the ability to recognize those waves, a bit like you know, if you're at a cocktail party uh, where everybody's speaking English, but your first language is different, and you hear someone across the room speaking your native language, you can hear them. How is that possible? You can't hear anybody else across the room, but you can hear them. So there are ways of encoding that can actually make, um, that, that, that can actually deal with interference in a way that's, that's more constructive than simply placing everybody in separate rooms. And that's, um, uh, but, but that's an, an evolving technology. So how do we go about giving out spectrum? Well, you know, it has a bit of a history. The, um, the you know, up until about 20 years ago, the general approach was first come, first serve, right? There was lots of it, and it, it didn't have the same kind of value it has today. So generally, you know, if you wanted spectrum and you had a re you know, reasonably good reason, you got it. And certainly, you know, the incumbent mobile operators in, uh, in South Africa, that's how they got their spectrum. And it's not bad, it's just the reality of how things were then. Then, of course, as demand for spectrum increased, you know, it, we, you know the, and, and there, were, there was more demand than supply, uh, or, or at least administratively more demand than supply, they, you know, they began to think about, well, how do we do this? How do we do it better? How do we make sure the best person gets that spectrum? And the notion of uh, a beauty contest evolved, which was a kind of qualitative analysis of all the people who wanted the spectrum and picking the ones who would do it at the best price but also serve the best interests of the country. And indeed, the 2.6 and 3.5 uh, um, uh, gigahertz auctions uh, in their initial incarnation followed this approach of, uh, of uh, combining, actually, a, um, a beauty contest and an auction. The problem with beauty contests is they're, you know, like beauty itself, completely subjective. 
and, uh, uh, and also prone to influence. So not only is it possible to, to weight the answer uh, and, uh, in, a, in a way because the, uh, it's a qualitative assessment uh, to weight the answer and justify your outcome. Worse than that, it's easy to block because um, you know, you can, it's easy to obstruct from a legal point of view because you can argue uh, till you're, you know, to the ends of the earth that qualitatively they have not satisfied the conditions of the contest. So beauty contests tend to be problematic, tend to uh, wind up in long administrative delays, which is delays is often the worst enemy. Now, on the other hand, I'd like to talk about unlicensed spectrum, the sort of uh, it was, you know, the, the unloved son of, of spectrum allocation uh, uh, for a long time. You know, a small chunk of spectrum in the 2.4 and uh, 5.8 uh, gigahertz band that was largely for experimentation. You know, they gave it, let's you know, give those scientists a little space to, to explore. Uh, that little space exploded uh, because of its unlicensed nature and because of uh, industry associations' willingness to, to adopt standards for how to play together nicely. Uh, it has gone from, uh, you know, almost unused space from one megabit per second to almost 600 megabits per second, and I'm speaking specifically of Wi-Fi. Obviously, there are lots of uses for unlicensed spectrum, but Wi-Fi has um, not only grown in terms of its capacity, but it's uh, correspondingly dropped in price. Uh, to the extent that there's Wi-Fi in almost everything we see now. You see on the screen there, there's an iPhone, a Kindle, uh, an old feature phone uh, that all have Wi-Fi, but also a bathroom scale. You can buy bathroom scales that, uh, that will report your weight to the internet. God knows why you would want to do that. But, um, and, uh, you know, a fridge, a Wi-Fi-enabled fridge that will tell you when to reorder milk. I mean, it's, uh, it's reached the point of, of ubiquity. Next year, over a billion Wi-Fi chipsets will ship globally. That's more Wi-Fi chipsets than mobile phones. So when people talk about the mobile phone miracle in Africa, it's true, but they are missing out on the other side of the equation of that same technology which is capable of, um, uh, of, of amazing access. And it, it, I, for me, I find it amazing that, uh, that any mobile operator with a long-term strategy in Africa does not have a comprehensive Wi-Fi strategy as a complementary technology in terms of providing access, especially for, because as we see the demand increasing for, for data over, over mobile networks, you know, Wi-Fi is emerging as the premier option to actually offload some of that, that backhaul need for data. So having, having a Wi-Fi strategy is just, you know, it, it only makes sense because of the ubiquity and affordability and power of the technology. But of course, you can't, I mean, there's always going to be a, a mix of things. You don't want to just uh, give out all the spectrum. There are always going to be investors who will require the surety of uh, full access and full title to a chunk of spectrum in order to guarantee the investment required. Also in terms of global standards for operation, in terms of interoperability and mobile networks. So fully, fully licensed spectrum isn't going away. The question is how should people get it? And, um, and there's a lot of, um, I, I think, um, mythology around, around whether auctions are a good idea or not. Some people argue they're just a means for, for the government to you know, have a, a new source of revenue for the treasury. And certainly, you know, uh, spectrum auctions can generate a lot of income. Um, there is an argument uh, that, uh, you know, for instance, the 3G auctions in Europe, that people overpaid and they were unable to afford to roll out their network. Um, well, I have two comments on that. One is that, I mean, that was in the early days of spectrum auction technology and processes, and, uh, and spectrum, um, spectrum auction um, uh, processes have evolved a huge amount since then, and designed specifically to make sure that people pay the optimum price, not, uh, not overpay. Um, also, you know, if you overinvest in a spectrum license to the point where you can't roll out a network, that may point to a strategic issue with your company. But um, the, um, so nowadays, uh, spectrum auctions, uh, they work very well when they're done right. And when they're done badly, it almost would have been better if you'd given away the spectrum. Right? Because, uh, uh, because if they're done badly, they can be subject to, to legal challenges, they can be gamed, they can go to the wrong person, and they can actually tie up the process longer than if you've just given it away. So the, 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 the cost of delay is a factor that has to be considered in this. Happily, 
There are plenty of, uh, of, of experts now globally who have lots of experience in running these uh, in a way that, that not only sort of uh, maximizes the chances of fairness uh, in terms of the bidders, um, but also uh, optimizes the outcome so that people pay, the person who values the spectrum um, uh, gets it, or values the spectrum most gets it, but doesn't pay over the odds. And, you know, there's a lot of game theory involved now in, in auctions to the point where some of the major players and bidders in the U.S. auctions are, are hiring game theory companies to help them bid those auctions and paying lower prices as a result. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing because it's getting, reading that, uh, reaching that kind of optima, optimality in terms of value for spectrum that, that you want. So the key lesson there for me of the last 10 years is hire pros if you're going to do that. And I believe that's what Nikas is doing right now. But arguably, for me, uh, the most interesting space is actually neither fish nor fowl. It's, it's in between unlicensed spectrum and licensed spectrum. And it's what is referred to as serendipitous reuse of, of spectrum. So being, not being the primary spectrum owner, but being a secondary user of that spectrum so that um, you can, when, when the primary user is not using the spectrum, you get to use it. And uh, that's great in theory, but how does it operate in practice? Well, advances of technology have, have enabled this idea to go from theory into, into practicality, in particular with TV white spaces spectrum. Um, when spectrum licenses were first granted for television broadcasters, it was back in around the 1930s, I mean, if you can imagine how crude the technology was there, you basically had to be, do the equivalent of shouting because of the relatively deaf television sets that, that they had out there. So, um, and because there was all the shouting going on, they had to actually move the television uh, channels away from each other. In fact, they would guarantee an empty channel next to any uh, television broadcaster. And this is what's known as the, as the TV white spaces, that, that white space on old televisions that you used to see there, that, that noise, that was the empty gap uh, that, that regulators left. Now, thanks to uh, advances in technology, we can serendipitously reuse that spectrum um, to actually deliver um, amazing broadband and do it in a way that is very, very low overhead. Now, this has gone ahead in the, um, in the US. The FCC in two th late 2008 authorized the use of uh, uh, TV white spaces te spectrum technology. Huge pushback from the broadcasters, from people who make wireless microphones. There was a, a huge lobby against it, and they didn't feel that the sensing technology, which allowed them to sense whether the spectrum was in use and move over, was good enough. Um, so they came to a compromise, and it turned out to be actually quite a smart compromise, and that they decided they would have geolocation databases where the TV white spaces devices would actually have to connect and authenticate to a uh, geolocation database that would actually allow them to turn on. So it gave great control to the regulator to say, you know, this is not going to get out of hand, so there's not going to be a tragedy of the commons here, but it's still unlicensed uh, spectrum that, uh, that allows for innovation, entrepreneurship, standards-based uh, innovation for, for unpredicted um, uh, consequences in terms of how people might use it. So quite a, quite a happy medium. Now, um, how many people were at... Um, at iWeek two, two years ago, 2009. Okay, so I actually gave most of this talk in, uh, in 2009. I said many of the same things I said today, um, and um, as I was looking through the presentation, you know, I, I, it crept up on me, well, you know, so what? what what's changed? And here's, here's what's changed. Um, so first of all, massive progress in terms of TV white spaces regulation elsewhere in the world. Uh, the U.S. has moved ahead. They've now uh, re just recently nominated companies to manage the geolocation databases. Uh, the regulation has become more entrenched. That means manufacturers are producing more. Um, the U.K., Ofcom, uh, only, I think, two months ago, leapt ahead of the U.S. in terms of their regulation and looks like they're going to get TV white spaces technology to market even faster than, uh, the, than the U.S. Industry Canada, the... Um, the Department of Industry in Canada have just launched, launched a public consultation based on the U.S. and U.K. examples. So what this means is that uh, manufacturers are now going full speed ahead in developing these devices. And if you want to understand these devices, you think of a Wi-Fi-like device, but that operates with spectrum sensing and in and around the kind of 3 to 700 megahertz range, which gives them tremendous range. We're talking you know, at least several megabits per second over 10 kilometers is the kind of range we're talking about. Amazing for a rural rollout. I mean, this is, you know, if you think about TV white spaces, you know, how much, how much gap there is for reuse in the U.S., 
uh, in terms of you know the number of tele terrestrial television stations there, and then you know how many television stations there are uh, in South Africa. There is a lot of bandwidth that could be almost immediately reused for um, for for rural broadband purposes. It is like a cherry waiting to drop from the tree because it doesn't involve refarming spectrum. It doesn't involve reallocating. It doesn't, it's not subject to those processes. And the technology is, is going to be mass market available towards the end of 2012, uh, early 2013. So, you know, in terms of the low hanging fruit of regulation, uh, this, you know, uh, you know, two years ago, the, the apple was not quite ripe. It's definitely ripe now. Um, so what else has happened uh, in two years? Well, um, there, there was an attempt at having an auction and um, and I and and that was um, an an interesting opportunity to learn, I think. Um, so if you if you look in the 2.6 gigahertz uh, band, um, in the attempt to auction that spectrum, uh, Ecasa rightfully opted for as technology neutral uh, a solution as possible. But in order to be technology neutral, in order to embrace um, as many technologies as possible, uh, some technologies prefer to use uh, either end of the spectrum. Uh, FDD um, LTE uh, technology uses either end of the spectrum and not just anywhere in the spectrum. So anyone who wanted that spectrum had to have either end. Unfortunately, Centec uh, uh, and iBurst held that early chunk of the, uh, the 2.6 uh, gigahertz spectrum. So, and that was an important learning point for me because it was like being punished twice. So Centec did not deliver ultimately um, uh, for reasons which you know can be debated uh, in terms of its rollout of using that spectrum, and that was that was painful that that, that did not succeed because it was a, a huge opportunity. Um, but it's painful again because it's actually the, the the ownership of that spectrum is actually retarding the um, uh, the auction of the 2.6 gigahertz uh, spectrum because they need now need to be relocated in order for that auction to go ahead in a technology neutral fashion. So. The, the danger there is, is not just in uh, uh, giving away spectrum. Once you give away spectrum, it's very hard to get it back. It's very hard to move it. So there are consequences there that I, that I want to get into in, in, in a slightly different context. So I look at this in the context of the global meltdown. Now, granted, 2009, we were already in full swing in terms of the global meltdown. But the most interesting book I've read about that time uh, it's actually by uh, an economist named Tim Harford. He wrote a book called Adapt. And, um, and he tried to analyze from a, an economics point of view what went wrong and what's wrong with these systems that fail so spectacularly. And uh, so, you know, whether it's the global financial systems that were too tightly coupled to, um, uh, to actually, you know, be de deconnected and, and stop the kind of domino effect uh, or the, uh, the Fukushima reactor that failed in a way that, you know, where the cost vastly exceeded whatever safety precautions were, were implement implemented. And his conclusion was essentially that, that, you know, we are in a world of increasing complexity. And I don't think that's really a revelation for anybody, but that with increasing complexity, our ability to predict the future diminishes. So we're going to get things wrong more often from now on. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but, it, but it means we need different strategies. So grand plans are kind of, you know, are out. You know, grand plans that, um, that where, where, you know, we think we're going, to, we're going to roll this way and it's all going to happen that way, the chances of failure are, 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 are pretty large. So we need, and, and when you get catastrophic failure, those are, those are failures you can't afford. They're too expensive. You know, they call it, in the U.S., they call them too big to fail. It's a cliche, but it's true. So um, when thinking about spectrum regulation, what we need are systems that fail well. So if we give a big chunk of spectrum away to somebody, uh, you know, for uh, you know, a national rollout, and they don't do it, and they have a huge team of lawyers that tell you, well, we are doing it, that's a catastrophic failure. And we need to think about regulation to, to avoid that. And the way, I mean, so uh, Tim, Tim Harford's argument is small bets. Uh, take an evolutionary process and, and make small bets and allow for successes to multiply. And that, I think, is, is actually, I found it hugely instructive in terms of thinking about how you might approach spectrum regulation. So um, a digital dividend, 
another you know issue of something that that should have happened by now but hasn't happened so what you know what are, what are the potentials for catastrophic failure there whether it's whether it's set top boxes or you know the uh, long delays that that deny other people access to the spectrum that that should be made available there and the other thing that's changed is just is i wouldn't have predicted two years ago just how ubiquitous and how cheap wi-fi is so that was a, a learning point for me so so what should we do, as I said, create systems that fail well, make small bets, and, uh, and, and, and replicate the successes as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of auctions, um, uh, use set-asides. And, and set-asides means guarantee a portion of any auction to a new market entrant. There are two ways that regulators can actually help the market behave. One is in a remedial manner. They can try and correct the behavior of, of what they, they think is not good behavior in the market. And two, they can introduce um, new, mark, uh, new entrance into the market. And hands down, the, the latter approach is more successful because often the first approach where you try to uh, uh, intervene remedially, um, the consequences are not what you predict. So um, you know, getting new players into the market is, is the magic bullet, in my opinion. And lastly, more transparency. Right? This is the tip of the iceberg, the spectrum that I've been talking about. We don't know who's got what and who's using it. So, you know, publishing a list of all spectrum assignments with the possible exception or, you know, the necessary exception of military use of, of spectrum and actually doing, you know, regular spectrum audits so that, so that you know, it, you can actually know what, what spectrum's in use. I think that's the, the key to, to unlocking this particular bottleneck in terms of improving access. Um, that's my message. So thanks for listening. I think that uh, if, if you'd asked me six months ago, I would have said it was tragic uh, because, um, you know, the U.S. has been the pioneer in this process. I think uh, Ofcom have taken, have, have, have leapt ahead in terms of um, uh, approach to this now and, uh, and having Canada actually following both Ofcom and the U.S., no, I, I think it's unstoppable now. I think it was very fragile for a while, but I'm, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been.